Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I am very happy to have back on the podcast Kai Bird. Kai is a historian, writer, and biographer. He has written numerous books. Much of his work uh, has been on some write- critical writings on the Vietnam War, nuclear weapons, Hiroshima, uh, Cold War, etc. He has won the National Books Critics Circle Award, Duff Cooper Prize for History. He was awarded an honorary doctorate from Carleton College. He's an elected member of the prestigious Society of American Historians. And he is a Pulitzer Prize winner. Uh, He won the Pulitzer for the book, American Prometheus, The Triumph and Tragedy of J. Robert Oppenheimer, who he co-authored with uh, Martin J. Sherwin. Uh, More recently, he wrote the fabulous book, the Outlier, The Unfinished Presidency of Jimmy Carter. Uh, so that was the first conversation I had with Kai. He came on. We talked about uh, Jimmy Carter and that biography. Uh, a fabulous conversation. Uh, Kai is, is is a wonderful writer. He's a wonderful communicator. Um, and really, really got, I think, the essence of, of Jimmy Carter. And uh, I absolutely love that conversation. And at some point there, I don't know if it was uh, we we were chatting off offline or somewhere in the conversation, but I I told him I would love for him to come back on and and talk about uh, his book on Oppenheimer. And uh, you know, obviously, it won a Pulitzer, and um, and uh, so it's a fabulous book. I since reread it and in prepare, preparation for this conversation. And he was very kind to come back on, and we talked about the book Oppenheimer. We had this conversation. Um, earlier this year, and I told him I would hold on to the conversation and release it uh, now uh, for a particular reason. As many people will know, uh, there is a film that is coming out. Uh, The film is called Oppenheimer. It is the new film by Christopher Nolan, which uh, has um, many all-star casts, Killian Murphy, Matt Damon, Robert Downey Jr., Emily Blunt, uh, Florence Pugh, among others. for folks that uh, enjoy uh, Nolan's films, I highly, highly, highly encourage people to go and find one of the 20 theaters in the country in the U.S. that just shown it in uh, IMAX 70 millimeter. Uh, it's just an absolute uh, event, really. It's supposed to be fa- fabulous. Anyways, Christopher Nolan wrote the screenplay based on uh, Kai Bird's uh, Pulitzer Prize winning biography with, with, uh, with Marty. And so I thought it would be you know pretty fantastic to um, talk with Kai again uh, uh, and, but about this book on its own merits but also since there's uh, you know a major major film coming out about uh, Oppenheimer but using uh, his book uh, Nolan wrote the screenplay from uh, based on on uh, on Kai's uh, biography and so uh, we have a wonderful conversation uh, understanding about, uh, trying to understand about uh, Oppenheimer. So Kai talks about how he wrote the Oppenheimer book with uh, with Martin Sherman, uh, who's now passed, uh, how they did it, how they, they wrote it together. Um, really, really fascinating. Uh, we talk about the elusive nature of Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer is a interesting, interesting person, hard to kind of really, really understand him. And uh, Kai talks about that. He talks about how he got into theoretical physics, talks about how he built the atomic bomb and what they knew beforehand, uh, before there was impact. Much of the book, and, and we talk about in the conversation, is his involvement with communism. And there was, it was just kind of plagued by this his whole life. Was he a commie? Was he not? Friends and family members that maybe were, but he, did he really join? And very, very interesting. We talk about the AEC hearings. We talk about the end of Oppenheimer's days. And the legacy of Oppenheimer. And, you know, Kai believes, and I, I would agree after reading the book, and I think partly this is what the film is trying to also show, Oppenheimer is one of the most important people definitely in the 20th century, and I would say into the 21st century. If you don't have these bombs built I don't know if you could say there would be no Cold War, but you know this this kind of started it. This it, it was built. It it was detonated, unfortunately, and and the devastation it, it, it caused. 
And we still to this day, when we talk about conflicts with certain nation states, you know, who has who has bomb you know nuclear bombs, who doesn't? You know, is there an arms race? Is it, and this was the first. This was the first one that was that was built. This was the one that was there. This was the one that was detonated, and just started this kind of ripple effect. And and that's you know, in, in many negative ways, momentous. And understanding the person that created the bomb and and how it was made and what was going on in his his mind and and I think is supremely important and again obviously so I mean it's a masterful job that Kai and, and Marty did writing the, the American Prometheus the biography on on Oppenheimer and um and so I would highly encourage people to uh read the book uh, it's it's again fabulous uh, go see the film uh, in in the in the biggest screen you possibly can, and uh, and I hope everyone enjoys this conversation. As usual, you can find uh, this conversation, all past and upcoming conversations, including my previous conversation with Kai, at convergingdialogues.substack.com. Subscribe, like, uh, engage, share with your friends, and I'm also on YouTube as well. You can do the same there. And uh, now I bring you Kai Bird. Uh, I'm here with Kai Bird. Uh, Kai, thanks uh, for coming on the podcast again. I'm uh, very appreciative of that. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah. So we talked, I guess, uh, maybe a, I don't guess a year or so ago, <clears throat> maybe two years, where you had the uh, biography on Jimmy Carter, The Outlier, which uh, we talked about all about Carter. That was a great conversation. Folks can uh, check that out. And one of your earlier works um american prometheus the triumph and tragedy of j robert oppenheimer which you want with uh with martin uh sherwin which you uh won the pulitzer prize uh is the book that i want to talk to you about today so there's a um, there's a film coming out and uh i believe it's loosely based uh on on this book and so i thought it would be really really cool to talk about the book um, because it's absolutely fabulous. I've read it a couple times now, and uh, and talk about the life of Oppenheimer. So, um, I guess the first question I have is: is how did you? You know, I know it's you have a co-author here. How did you get involved uh, with the co-author, and how did you guys, I guess, write the book and choose to write it on Oppenheimer? Well, alas, Marty Sherwin, Martin J. Sherwin, is no longer with us. He oh, sorry to hear that. He died in October 2021. Mm. Um, but he started this book in 1980. Wow. <laughs> so, wow. And he then spent 20 years researching it. Mm. And in 2000, he we were friends by then, initially acquaintances, and but we became good friends. And he, in 2000, uh, came to me, and I was unemployed. I had finished writing a, a previous book and was casting around for a new project or a regular salary, as my wife would have preferred. But <laughs> 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 and uh, Marty suggested that we should team up on Oppenheimer, mm -hmm. um, partly because I, in my previous work, I written two biographies about people who had had to do with things nuclear, mm -hmm. atomic bomb, uh, John McCloy and uh, William Bundy and George Bundy. But uh, I, I actually, to tell you the truth, I initially turned him down. Oh, yeah. Because uh, co-authorship is often fraught with problems and conflicts and i told marty i liked him too much to be his co-op <laughs> <laughs> you wanted to keep the friendship and not get it spoiled yeah. by uh, any work stuff yeah yeah right and uh so he he understood he understood that i was reluctant because on my very first biography i'd, I'd had a co-author that ended badly and uh my wife had said that she could never Stand to have me work with another author. It was too much, too much anguish. And uh, so Marty understood that he had to persuade my wife, not me. 
<laughs> as it goes. <laughs> um, anyway, he was a very funny guy and charming, and he succeeded in persuading Susan that this was good for him and good for me, and it would be a terrific collaboration. And he he jokingly said, "You know, if Kai doesn't join me, my gravestone is going to read he took it with him." <laughs> <laughs> That was very funny. <laughs> uh, and, you know, this happens with biographers on uh, not infrequently. You know, they get into the subject and they endlessly research and, and fervently believe that there's always something missing and mm. one more archive to visit. And, mm. uh, you know, it's biographer's disease. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, Marty was a terrific writer. He just uh, he got deep into the research and couldn't stop researching. And so when I came aboard, we started to write. Ah, I see. And it still took five years. Yeah. Before the book came out. Yeah. So, so I guess tell me this. I mean, I mean, obviously, there's the the you know pros and cons of co-authorship, but I guess just tell me about generally about Oppenheimer. Is there seems to be this kind of enigma around him uh this like elusiveness quality and, and you're kind of mentioning it here there just seems to be a lot to research about him i mean was it hard i guess to really get him as a person obviously there's you know him as a he was a you know brilliant man uh you know eccentric in some ways uh, kind in other yeah, ways he but... was elusive he was an enigma he he was purposely mysterious uh -huh. throughout his life you know he would he had something of the actor in him, uh -huh. and he could put on a performance. Mm. And sometimes you <clears throat> you weren't quite sure what he was doing or what he believed. Mm. Um, so you know there were many mysteries about him. He had a, a very conventional childhood in one respect, in that he grew up in New York City, the, the son of. of a wealthy businessman, self-made businessman. I mean, um, so Oppie Op grew up, you know, in, a, in an Upper West Side apartment in Manhattan with ten rooms and a servant and a chauffeur and a car and a mm. nice sailboat out on Long Island. And uh, he went to a private school, but he had a he he was. Uh, a strange little boy in some ways. He was very interested in science already. In uh, he had a, an enormous rock collection. Mm -hmm. got interested in geology and then chemistry. Um, and uh, but he was kind. Yeah, you know, he was kind of a nerd yeah. and socially awkward. And uh, yeah, he sort of you know had an awkward adolescence, like many kids. Mm -hmm. um, but there was an incident in, the, in his when he was in uh, graduate school at, in Cambridge, England, where he really had a, an emotional crisis, a yeah. nervous breakdown. It's mm -hmm. called the poison apple incident. Mm -hmm. And there's a mystery about it. What exactly happened? Something happened that got him suspended, that got him... Uh, going to see uh, a psychoanalyst mm -hmm. and uh, it's a mystery and we had to really mm -hmm. dig into the sources and figure out what was what was the truth of the, that incident mm -hmm. likewise there's a great mystery later on in his life about his politics he yeah. got involved in uh, left-wing politics in Berkeley in the 1930s, mm -hmm. largely through his girlfriend, Jean Tatlock, who was a member of the Communist Party. Right. But there was a mystery, and uh, historians argue to this day about the evidence about whether he was just close to the party and right. gave contributions as much as $400 a year to the party, or was he an actual formal member? Yeah. Yeah. Under party discipline, and Marty and I satisfied ourselves that he was actually never a member of the party. That he was not the kind of personality who would submit himself to party discipline and all yeah. of that. But no, he was 
Anyway, he was complicated and always, <laughs> always a mystery at times. <laughs> yeah, I definitely want to ask you about the the communist stuff because it's such a big part of his his story and and in the book too. But I guess just the one thing is, you know, kind of as he was coming up, you know, and, and, and growing up, and he 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 eventually went to, you know, he, he spent some time in Cambridge, and then he um, he went on and and uh, and graduated uh, at. Uh, uh, Gutengein, uh, how did he get to um, theoretical physics? You know, because I think initially he went for chemistry and that didn't work out so well. Was it just that he had a love and a passion for physics and he really liked that more? Or was he just good at the math and could just get it conceptually and and kind of like a, you know, this really, really brilliant person in that way? What was it that he kind of landed in physics and started publishing very, very highly? Yeah, he, you know, he was successful as a young man at Harvard. He finished Harvard in three years, graduating in physics, but experimental physics, um, so laboratory physics. And then he went to Cambridge to study under a famous experimental physicist there, and it turned out he was not very good at it. He was clumsy in the laboratory with his hands. He broke things. He, you know, he didn't have the patience to be that meticulous with the, in the laboratory. And uh, this contributed to his emotional crisis that year and near breakdown of some sort. Um, and then he discovered, this was 1926, and he discovered quantum physics, which was just on the cutting edge, just coming out, Niels Bohr and... Uh, Heisenberg in Germany uh, were writing these papers. That, and Oppenheimer, as a young man, just he understood this mm. very complicated concept of the quantum. And he was good at it. Mm. He wasn't particularly good at the math, actually. No. <laughs> but, but quantum doesn't, you know, is a mysterious um, school of physics to this day. Yeah. Uh, but it explains the, our world. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he was just brilliant. He, and he, in, within a year, he wrote a thesis that was accepted and got his PhD in Germany, studying under Max Born. And uh, in 1927, finishes and comes back to America and, and decides to go to Berkeley, mm -hmm. sort of to be a big fish in a small pond and to start a department in, in quantum physics. So how, how does he, he gets to, he gets to Berkeley, but then afterwards he gets to, uh, there's this, uh, the Manhattan project and, you know, in Los Alamos and he's building a lab, recruiting scientists. How did that kind of start? What was the like origins for, for, you know, wanting to do that whole Manhattan project and how do we get to this idea of him, becoming a part of building, you know, the, the nuclear weapon. Yeah, no, that was a, sort of an improbable chapter. Um, you know, here in 1941-42, when he's recruited by General Leslie Groves, who was the general appointed to supervise the Manhattan Project, very secret $2 billion mm -hmm. government project to build the bomb, uh, Groves toured around the country for a couple of months talking to various physicists and scientists. And, um, and he obviously he needed a scientific director who could organize the whole thing. And uh, Oppenheimer, he met in Berkeley, and they somehow clicked, mm. most improbably. You know, Groves was a sort of gruff army general type, very conservative politics. Oppenheimer was what, 30, 36 years old and hadn't administered anything more than a couple of grad, you know, a dozen graduate students at that point. So he wasn't an administrator. But he could, uh, Groves could see that he was ambitious and smart, and he could explain the science in plain English. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. So that was important to Groves, and uh, he selected him, even though you know Oppenheimer did not have a Nobel Prize, and he was actually recruiting some scientists who had won the Nobel. Oh. Uh, 
he, you know, he hadn't written that many papers. But anyway, it was a brilliant selection because everyone admits that the bomb would not have been designed and produced in two and a half years like it was if anyone else had been directing it other than Oppenheimer. He was just, he transformed himself into a brilliant administrator. He was very charismatic. He built this secret city in Los Alamos, New Mexico, from you know zero to a, a population of six thousand scientists and engineers and workers, and, and uh, I mean it was just an extraordinary tale. Mm. So I guess tell us about the I guess the bomb specifically. So how did it you know they're, they're, they have the whole lab and everything and. You mentioned that it was more engineering than theoretical physics uh, in, a, in a large part. So how how did they get to start building it? How was it done? Um, yeah, just tell us, I guess, about the bomb and, and making it. Yeah, well, you know, by 1939, Oppenheimer and other select physicists around the world knew that fission was possible. Mm. Uh, you know, there had been one experiment where fission had been produced, breaking down the atom. And it, it, that immediately led to everyone who understood the, the experiment that a, a bomb was possible. So the, Oppenheimer famously later said that no physics was done during World War II. It, you know, they all knew they didn't have to invent anything new about in, in theoretical physics or whatnot. It was an engineering problem. It was a problem of how do you um, create enough enriched uranium or plutonium, this even rarer material, um, that would make it possible to make a bomb, and then how, how would you ignite it? What would be the ignition mechanism? And so these were relatively minor <laughs> engineering problems, and uh, it took two and a half years, but Oppenheimer gathered the right people together and, um, and uh, you know, made it happen. But he also, it's important to understand, and I don't think this is understood by most people, even all these decades later, that uh, Oppenheimer tried to impress on the world in 1945 after Hiroshima and Nagasaki that, you know, this was not um, complicated science, per se. It was not something that uh, was going to be difficult for anyone else to do. And he famously gave a speech in which he reminded people that, uh, you know, yes, it cost $2 billion, but that was cheap. Mm -hmm. And uh, now that it's known what can be done, any country, however poor, however small, that sets its mind to building mm -hmm. this weapon can do so. Mm -hmm. There are no secrets about it. And uh, it's a pretty straightforward, um, you know, sometimes expensive for relatively speaking. But you know, he's been, of course, proven right. Now North Korea has a bomb and Pakistan has a bomb and India. I mean, it's mm -hmm. uh, so it 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 was an enormous achievement at the time, but. Uh, that didn't mean that others couldn't do it as well. And that's a very scary thought for the security of, the, of all mankind. <laughs> yeah, um, certainly, certainly. I guess we can talk about Hiroshima and Nagasaki in a minute, but I guess beforehand when they're, this whole lab and all these scientists and himself were creating this, was there any, I mean, how much did they realistically know what the impact was going to be? Like when we see that big mushroom cloud and all the carnage afterwards in, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it's like, did, did they know that that was a possibility? Did they think it would be worse? Did they think it would be less, you know, impactful? How, what was their, I guess, their models or their, you know, predictions of what this would, could do or what it would do? What were they thinking beforehand, I guess? Oh, yes. They understood it from the very beginning that 
it was going to be a weapon of mass destruction, that it was going to be horrendous, that it would need a target so large that it could only be a city. Uh, they understood all of that. And Oppenheimer and the others who thought about the moral ethics involved, uh, they persuaded themselves that they had to proceed and rush ahead with this project precisely because they knew that the Germans could do it. Mm. And Oppenheimer had studied physics in Germany. He knew mm. Heisenberg, uh, who led the German bomb project, by the way. Mm. And he knew that they were as perfectly capable as he was of building this thing. And he feared that Hitler would get the bomb before America and would win the war with it. And, mm. you know, he feared German fascism. Yeah. Rightly so. So this was his motivation and the motivation of most of the people at Los Alamos. And they actually, you know, thought about this seriously. And in the spring of 1945, there were physicists in Los Alamos um, who raised the question, well, why are we working so hard now mm -hmm. in April of 1945 when we can see the Allied armies are on at the gates of Berlin and the war is over for Germany and they haven't produced the bomb. And uh, Oppenheimer made the argument explicit, explicitly that this war needed to end with a demonstration of this terrible weapon because you didn't want the next war to be fought with um, both, both parties, all parties, having atomic weapons. That would be apocalyptic. So he wanted to say, he made the argument that we need to demonstrate this either on a city to end the war in Japan, or there, were, there was some thought about uh, a peace, so-called peaceful demonstration, you know, blowing up the top of Mount Fuji <laughs> demonstrating it in the Pacific Ocean. But in the end, this was not a decision that he was party to about how to use the bomb. This was a decision that Harry Truman, Les Rose, and others made. It's, a, it's, it's, I'll be honest, it's, I mean, I can get the logic, but it's so hard to, to think about it, you know, 60, what is it, 80 years later, seven years later, whatever it is. Um, I mean, it's they're, they're still decimating and wiping out thousands of people. Right. I mean, for for a demonstration. I mean, it's it just so hard to. I mean, I get their logic, and I, at at the time, I mean, I I get it, but it. I still, oh man, there had to have been other ways. <laughs> I, well, I get I get the whole thing of not wanting the Germans to get it either. That's not a good idea either. So. Right. Well, no, it's a quandary. Um, at one point, you know, I, I, my. Co-author Marty did most of the research, but at one point I happened to track down a, a woman who uh, was this Oppenheimer's last secretary at, <clears throat> at Los Alamos. And she told me a story about how she was one day in the summer of 45, after the Trinity test had already been successfully executed and they demonstrated the bomb in the desert of New Mexico. She was walking to work with Oppenheimer, and she suddenly heard him muttering under his breath, those poor little people, those poor little people. Mm. And he, she says, Robert, what are you talking about? And he explained, you know, the bomb has been tested. It's going to be used now on Japan. And I, you know, I know the victims are going to be innocent civilians and women and children just because the nature of the bomb is so big that it had it was going to take out a whole uh, city um well <clears throat> so he's aware of that but even that same week he was also meeting with the bombardiers who were going to be on the airplane to drop the bomb and he was instructing them exactly at what altitude it should be released and what altitude it should be detonated to yeah. have maximum destructive power. So he was capable of uh, a very complicated sets of behavior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. He was doing his duty. And yep. he was also aware that doing his duty, uh, he was going to be the instrument of of great suffering. Yeah. That's, that's, and that, that weighed hard. on him, I think, yeah. the rest of his life. Yeah, well, I was going to ask, what was his reaction to 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 these events? I mean, you know, when they go, when it goes off, and and you see the all the devastation. Yeah. I mean, what was what? Did, I mean, oof. well, when he saw the Trinity test, he turned to his brother Frank and simply said, "It worked." <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, interviewed by a New York Times reporter, you know, the next day. <clears throat> He tells the reporter very dramatically, he embellishes a little bit. You know, I said, there's the actor in him. Well, it came out and he told the reporter, when he saw the flash of the Trinity test, it brought to mind the the phrase from the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, uh, I, am, I am death, destroyer of worlds. Mm-hmm. So, you know, he could be very... Poetic, yeah, a little theatrical, dramatic, yeah. a little, yeah, a little yeah, over yeah. the top, but, <laughs> yeah. but in fact, he just said it worked. Mm. And you know, in in the years afterwards, he he never apologized for for the bomb. In fact, he explained that you know you you cannot stop science, you cannot stop yeah. mankind from trying to understand the physical world, and this was going to happen. Mm. Uh, the challenge was to control this weapon, and he yeah. worked hard to try to place international controls over it, mm-hmm. and uh, but unsuccessfully. And of course, this is part of the reason why he was brought down in the 1954 trial. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I want to come to that. So let's let's go backwards a little bit and talk about the whole communist thing. So obviously, in the 40s and 50s, especially the 50s, there was a the whole Red Scare thing. Um, I guess. You know, you 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 talk about it throughout the book that, you know, was he a part of the party? Was he not? He had lots of close affiliates. He had friends. He had, I think his brother was a part of the party. Is this correct? Um, right. He gave money. You know, all these things. That we, a lot of it looks circumstantially like this guy is trying to like, he's part of it. He's just trying to cover his tracks. That way he's not directly there. But I guess the whole question in all of that, again, you know, going back in that time frame. I mean, that was a big deal, right? Like if he if he was, that would have been a big deal. But I mean, they wiretapped his phones and his house and like all, the, all these places where he was at. There was a, a, a years long, you know, kind of dogged attempt to try and nail this on him. I mean, what 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 can we say about as best we can his 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 real feelings about communism, associating with folks like that? Or being okay with associating with folks that were communist, and then dealing with all of the almost paranoia of sorts of being you know, right. wiretapped. Well, you have to understand Oppenheimer in the context of the 1930s. Yes, he was a man of the left, politically speaking. He wasn't very political. He was still this nerdy physicist, you know, yeah. in his day job. Yeah, but his. The love of his life at that point in his life in the 1930s was Jean Tadlock, who was studying as a young woman to become a psychiatrist, a medical doctor. Yep. And she was a member of the Communist Party. And uh, she nagged him to be more socially involved and responsible. And, and, you know, the Communist Party in the 1930s, in the midst of the Depression, was doing good things for ordinary Americans, you know, trying to organize unions, trying to desegregate public schools and public pools in Berkeley. (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, And most prominently, uh, the, the Communist Party was seen as sort of, you know, part of the good guys in the Spanish Civil War. Uh, and the Spanish Civil War, as we realize now, was sort of a pre-runner of World War II, of fascism being triumphant in Spain, and uh, uh, you know, by General Franco revolting against the Republican government in, in uh, 
left-wing Spain at the time. And Oppenheimer sympathized with the cause of, uh, of Republican Spain. He raised money to send an ambulance to Spain. He, uh, you know, Kitty, his wife, had previously been married to uh, a young man, Joe Dallet, who actually volunteered to go to Spain with the Lincoln Brigade and was killed there. Mm. And Kitty herself was on her way to Spain when her husband Dallet was killed. I mean, this was a, a cause that many people were involved in. And so it wasn't any really, shouldn't be any surprise that uh, a young intellectual at a university called Berkeley in the 1930s would, would have left-wing sympathies and would regard the Communist Party as, you know, doing good work. Mm. They, you know, they had, you know, Oppenheimer had no sophisticated understanding of what the Communist Party was in Russia or what Stalin, you know, the crimes of Stalin. Yeah. Uh, you know, he was naive in that way. But um, anyway, it was it was understandable that he would be uh, close to the Communist Party. But Marty and I, you know, looked very closely at this and tried to look at all the arguments about whether he was a secret member of the party or and there's just no evidence and if there was you can be sure that the fbi would have brought it out sure and you know oppenheimer's fbi file runs to over eight thousand pages and there's just there's no smoking gun there mm. so he was a sympathizer he gave money to the party he uh, went to party meetings at times and rallies, and um, but he was never under party discipline or taking orders or involved in any conspiracy of such. So, and of course, this is what was brought. In, these are the allegations that were brought against him that he was maybe a party member and maybe a spy and maybe giving secrets to the Russians during World War II. And of course, there's no evidence of, of that either. Yeah, you mentioned that this stuff kind of follows him a little bit throughout his life. And then you, you mentioned the hearings. This is the AEC hearings, correct? And, and uh, how did how did I guess he handle this? I mean, for, from what I get in the book, it seems like it started to become very taxing on him uh, of sorts. Oh, yeah, it was, uh, you know, by 1945, uh, after it was revealed what he had done as scientific director, he became, you know, the most famous scientist in America. Yeah with the exception of Albert Einstein. Mm -hmm. and then Oppenheimer moved to the Institute for Advanced Studies, where he became the director and therefore the boss of Einstein. <laughs> and, you know, for the next nine years, he was a celebrity. Uh, his, you know, his, his photo appeared on the cover of Time magazine and Life, and you know he was invited to speaking engagements all over the country, and, and he was uh, he had a security clearance and was a member of uh, an advisory board to advise the government on how to control atomic weapons. Uh, you know this was uh, he was a player, and he liked this. He enjoyed it. He he wanted to use his influence for what he thought would be the greater good to try to explain to the policy, the politicians in Washington, how to, um, how to think about the atomic bomb. Mm -hmm. And when he began to give advice that was unpopular, this is when he created enemies inside the Washington bureaucracy who began to go after him. You know, by 1953, Eisenhower was president. And he was uh, spending hundreds of millions of dollars on expanding the nuclear arsenal. And uh, in the wake of the Russian ex uh, detonation of an atomic bomb in 1949, this created a little hysteria in America, uh, paranoia, and the thought was, oh, we have to get a bigger bomb. We have to, the Russians got the atomic bomb. We have to have a hydrogen bomb. 
Well, Oppenheimer thought this was ridiculous, and he said so, and said, we don't need bigger bombs. We need to control this technology and ideally ban the bombs, make it so that no one builds them. Um, well, this was advice that was uh, regarded as uh, not only unpopular, but pro perhaps uh, undermining the national security state. You know, the Pentagon was trying to spend more on on these weapons. The Air Force, Air Force wanted some of them. The Navy wanted some of them. I, I was, <laughs> so he was threatening their budgets by what he was saying. And uh, so as a result, uh, specifically a guy named Louis Straws uh, went after him and orchestrated a national a security hearing trial in secret um, to strip him of his security clearance. And, and in the course of this trial, questioned his patriotism. And, um, and it was, you know, it, was, it became, uh, it was a secret trial in the spring of 1954 that then when he was convicted in a way and stripped of his security clearance, all of this and the transcript of the trial was leaked to the New York Times. And it was humiliating. He was, he'd gone from being a national hero to being a suspected spy, mm -hmm. and disinvited from university engagements. And, uh, uh, and he almost lost his job as director of the Institute for Advanced Studies. And at, throughout the rest of his life, he was more or less a non-entity, not a public figure. Uh, it was, you know, it was a terrible. He became, he was the chief sort of celebrity victim of the McCarthy era. Yeah. And it sent a message to all scientists that you beware. Mm. Do not go off the reservation. Do not think that you can use your scientific expertise to speak about public policy issues, to talk about politics. And so, you know, this, this is a terrible legacy. It explains... For instance, during the pandemic, why so many Americans were distrustful of science and yeah. scientists and experts uh, on the virus. Yeah, uh, it's part of our culture now. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's it's, it's very very um, alarming, I guess you could say, uh, on, on on how some of folks that are doing hard work how they can be treated, and I guess. You know, he kind of goes again, like you said, from, you know, he's super brilliant, you know, kind of becomes a celebrity, almost kind of made a pariah, essentially. How did he live? So he dies in 1967. You know, how does he just after the, the hearings in 54, I guess, you know, where, where, what does he do the rest of the, the 50s and, and the 60s? He's still at the Institute, but he just kind of becomes not an invalid, but just very private and, and not, not much is he going on for him after that. Yeah, he retains his job barely at the as the director of the institute in Princeton, um, and he he's good at that. He's good at collecting interesting, brilliant people to do good intellectual work and inspires them. He's still charismatic in that way, but he no longer is a public figure. He no longer has a security clearance. He can no longer go down to Washington and and advise the president on policy. Um, and he actually retreated in the summer of 1954, and he loved sailing, so he ended up going, taking his family on an excursion to the Caribbean, renting a large yacht, and sailed around the Virgin Islands and fell in love with St. John in particular. Mm. Bought a little plot of land on the beach in St. John, built a cabin there, and he spent the rest of his life, many months of the year, in St. John. Mm. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> uh, and you know, it was sort of a sad, sad ending. Mm. And of course, he dies in 1967. He's only 64 years old. Yeah, He dies of esophageal cancer from all those cigarettes and pipe smoking. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, it's 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 
it's it's it's such an interesting story because of how you know brilliant he was and you know his obviously his place in history interesting how how it all kind of you know you know uh, fares out i guess the the last question i have here is what is i guess the legacy of oppenheimer that can most accurately help us understand him today i mean your guys you know book is obviously fabulous um very very easy to read really rich with content and 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 um but i guess i think most people say oh yeah the guy that built the atomic bomb but like what what is the the robust or really really uh you know accurate picture of how we look at oppenheimer and his legacy yeah he you know he's his life is iconic for our age for you know he's the father of the atomic bomb and we are still living in the nuclear age. It's not over. The story is not over. Yeah. It, the bomb hasn't been used since Nagasaki uh, as a weapon of war. But it's quite possible it will. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have a war now between Ru U the Ukraine and Russia, and the Russian president has already threatened the use of tactical nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And Oppenheimer was... His whole life, his his physics, but his humanity, his dedication, you know, he not only loved quantum physics, but he loved French poetry and and Hemingway's novels. And uh, you know, he he understood art and literature as well as science. And he was uh, ultimately, you know, a very gentle man. Uh, a humanitarian in the best sense of the word. And his life helps us to grapple, and it should encourage us all to grapple with this sort of existential questions of our nuclear age. We still are living with the bomb. Yeah. It's, it, we've, uh, you know, when I was growing up as a kid in the 1950s, uh, school children routinely practice for a nuclear war hiding under their desks. Yeah, it, was, yeah. it was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Now we no longer do that. And uh, so our culture sort of has forgotten that we're living under the threat of the bomb, even to this day. Mm. And this is something that we shouldn't forget. Mm. And Oppenheimer's life and this biography and the film that is coming out uh, by Christopher Nolan is going to, I hope, serve as a vehicle for a new generation of Americans to understand this history and to grapple with the issues of how we can avoid uh, Armageddon mm -hmm. and how we can live with the bomb. You can't uninvent it, so yeah. Yeah. you have to learn. You have to learn how to control it. We have to learn to live. Yeah, live I think that. I think that's right. I mean, I think his his you know obviously being the father of the atomic bomb and, and living with that, I think is right because every time or not every time, but many times now, when you know two big you know powers at least you know are in conflict, there's always very quickly, okay, they have a bomb. Okay, when does that get put on the table? It, you know, we hope it doesn't. We don't want it to, but. You know, there are certain countries that, you know, the United States, uh, uh, North Korea, you know, India, Pakistan, I think Israel, you know, if they have these capabilities, yikes, you know, that's that's really, you know, and, and that's obviously a terrifying thought for all the innocent people that could be, you know, taken out if it was used. And we've already seen the one example or two examples, I should say, but it's it's wild to me how that's still with us. You know, we don't think about it all the time. You know, it's it's you know we're, we're we're thankfully not doing that kind of warfare. I hope we don't, but I think you're absolutely right. How how do we how do we live with it? You can't you can't not invent it. And how do we live with it now? Right. No. And and Oppenheimer, you know, to his credit, he understood these sort of existential dilemmas right away. And three months after Hiroshima in October of forty five. You know, he gives a speech at the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia that's just quite extraordinary. You can listen to it on the web. Mm. And at one point in the speech, he 
he says, uh, you know, this this was a weapon that was used on a virtually defeated enemy. Mm. It is a weapon of terror. Mm. It is a weapon for aggressors. There's no defense. It's not a weapon to defend yourself. It's a weapon of terror. And this is exactly how Vladimir Putin is talking about nuclear weapons with regard to their possible use in Ukraine. Yeah. He's threatening terrorism with, with them. Yeah. <laughs> that's their, they have no military value. They're, you know, they're, the explosion is too big, too um, untargeted. It needs too big of a target. Even a tactical weapon uh, takes out a, a square mile. It, it's just, you know, they're they're weapons of terror. So that's how we need to think about them. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I I agree. It's it's very very uh, uh, good things to ponder in terms of how we can prevent those things. Well, again, the book is called American Prometheus: The Triumph and Tragedy of J. Robert Oppenheimer, winner of the Pulitzer Prize. It's been out for many years now. It's out in uh, paperback. Um, it's out It's out uh, everywhere you get books. Um, and as you mentioned as well, there's a film coming out, which from what I from what I hear is uh, over three hours. So it's, uh, it'll, be, it'll be a lot of fun. It'll be a lot of fun to see uh, what Nolan does with that. Uh, Kai, thanks so much for for your time and, and your and your energy and for for telling us about uh, Oppenheimer and the, the work uh, that you did with with, uh, with Marty um, I really really appreciate you sharing a lot of insights about uh, Oppenheimer it's a it's a fantastic book it's it's really really marvelous and uh, really appreciate it well thank you thank you absolutely <laughs>